Well, the, the joke I tell everyone is I moved here from Lake Tahoe. I grew up in Southern California. I left L.A. after film school. I was working in television for five years and um, had the opportunity to move to Lake Tahoe to start with a startup company there as a staff producer, director, uh, doing outdoor travel and, uh, videos. So I did that, and the f actually after a couple of years, the company folded. I ended up staying on in, in Lake Tahoe. I was able to buy my first professional video camera, and that was about 86. And at the time, my brother was living up in the Seattle area. He's living in Lake Stevens, actually. Is this Mark? Yeah, my okay. brother Mark. Yeah. And um, I met the woman who was babysitting their kids. And that's my current wife. And so Melissa was babysitting and so that's how you yeah. Melissa was babysitting and that's how you met her? Actually my sister in law set us up. Okay. She says, I I know your future wife. Really? That's what she said. Okay. And she knew knew that I had been kinda just bouncing around, a bunch of different girlfriends and whatnot, and I was <laughs> it was about twenty eight, twenty nine. I was kinda ready to settle down, I guess. Yeah. And so I decided to move up here with her and left Lake Tahoe. And so I moved from Incline Village, Nevada, with about 300 days of sunshine a year. The other 65 days, it snows like hell. And then it would clear up in the evening. I moved to Everett, Washington. <laughs> okay, so how long before when I met you, how did you moved here? Uh, if it was 93, I moved here in 89. Okay, so you'd been here for a few years. Yeah. And what were you doing before you opened your own media company? Um, well, I couldn't find a job. So my, the way I started Sierra Media is, uh, I was just going to start as, as a freelancer. I got my very first DBA and business license in the city of Everett. And actually we were living on 1726 and a half Baker Avenue oh. in 1987, 88. Oh and God. now here it is, 19 or 2019, and I just I moved into this building on Baker Avenue 20 years. Do you know what later. I remember about you? I remember that you were super hip. Like you had like the big shoulder pad, like like you looked like the Hollywood producer. You didn't <laughs> oh, dress geez. any <laughs> any way like anybody in Everett. Uh -huh. You were clearly a creative. Clearly uh, not cl from around here. Clearly not from around <laughs> here. You had, you know, you had the look of Hollywood. I mean, and that was super cool to me because, you know, I felt like, it's okay. It's funny because I shunned Hollywood. I just yeah, never, well, um, you were wearing the backwards uh, beret. <laughs> I was. I <laughs> you was. were definitely wearing the backwards yeah. beret. I felt like I was a kind of a, a medium-sized fish in a very small pond when I moved here because there was not a lot going on. Do you remember your first client? I do. I, uh, a woman from the, actually the, um, who's the family that runs Dick's Burger? Spain. Oh, the uh, Spain, Dick Sp Spady. Spady. Yeah. yeah. He spoke at an event that I met, like a, some kind of a thing, and I, I met somebody there, and she was the, um, I don't know, which for the city of Redmond, Kim Fernandez, and I'm still friends with her from this day, and oh she hired gosh. me to do a piece. For the city of Redmond, they had three of these videos they would do a year ba for their uh, growth management act. They had to do kind of forecasting of what the okay. the um, area is going to look like. And so I ended up working with her for 10 years and doing some work. And it, then I actually, that was the first local client I got. But um, to try to make money and get a, my sense of my bearings of the seattle area i took a job delivering the seattle weekly up in ever up in snohomish county so i'd go some weird place pick up bundles of weeklies and go distribute them to newspaper things all over snohomish county that's so funny i mean i remember i got the seattle weekly at the tropic of cancer and uh, i was like one of the only few people that ever read the weekly right. which i thought was so funny so i did that and then I took a job at a uh, computer sales place for no money. It was commission only. They needed a video oh, guy oh, because sucks. they and it was down in <laughs> in uh, Fremont actually or uh, uh, Green Lake or somewhere. Yeah. Um, and it, I met a woman who came in because I knew video, and that was when the video toaster was just getting going, and uh, 
they wanted somebody who can help sell wait, video. Wait, 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 wait. A video toaster? Yeah. If you're old enough and you know what the video toaster, it's a device that ran on an Amiga, on an Amiga computer that was the first kind of video editing, you know, it was a first video switcher. Okay, but not a toaster as in anything to do with baking your bread. No. Okay. They called it the video toaster. Okay, video it was, toaster. It was mind-blowing. Okay. It was something that just for like two grand, you can get something, and otherwise you had to spend $50,000 okay. to get a, a special effects generator to be able to mix videos, oh, right? okay, okay. So anyway, I, mi- I met this woman who had some videos that she needed editing and she wanted to buy a, a system. And I started getting digging, digging deeper into her questions about it. And I said, well, I can edit this for you. I didn't know how to edit videos and that isn't what you want to do. I, so I rented an editing system, brought it to her apartment, and I spent the whole weekend editing really crappy videos that she had taken in Japan. And she was a, a, a linguist. Uh, she was a, a woman who was... She had married a Japanese guy. Her father was a uh, Japan Airlines pilot, so she was enamored with Japan. So she learned Japanese. So she made a partnership with a Japanese magazine to that was an English language magazine in Japan. And so she wanted to do a video component for this magazine that was called Mini World. Okay. And so she hooked up with me, and I would create all these outdoor adventure videos that we'd make English lessons out of. Okay. And so, yeah, Dude. it got distributed through this magazine in Japan. So we created four one-hour videos that actually took about four years to do. And I, I traveled. I got to travel all over the place to Hawaii, oh, yeah. to Mexico, doing little stories for teaching English. And that was in the 90s. When I mean, the that's a nugget. That's a circle back, man. Yeah. I mean, that is super cool. And so that lasted a very long time, helped them to uh, distribute the VHS tapes, to design the covers, and, and it was pretty cool. And all that time I was creating, getting other clients and just kept plugging around. And so end of the story, or, or not the end, but the long story short is I, no one would hire me, so I started my own business. So what is a dream client for you? And don't say money because we uh, because that actually, I mean, having a, a paying there, client there, is always There's a saying, awesome, I have a... a saying in my office it's on the board uh real relationship or revenue it has to cover three r's real is r-e-e-l like your demo reel real okay if you're doing a project and it's not something that's really cool that'll go on your demo reel no you don't want to if the relationship isn't going to continue into other projects or something different or better Right. Yeah. So if it's if it's a crappy content, crappy relationship, that's two out of three. Yeah. But the revenue really should be good. Yeah. If they're all three are gone, I added a fourth R, and the fourth R is run. <laughs> okay. So, so. <laughs> I mean, we're I'm in a service business right. for the business. I uh, I'm not working to create my own content, although we are doing that now. But for our paying cl- customers. Um, to answer your question, it's customers that trust me, right. that trust what we do, that enable us to do our best yeah. work is our best clients. So what is, give me a story about like the, a, a horrible client or a situation that you had to just, just wasn't optimal. It's, I'm, I'm very forgiving for people. I totally forgive and forget. And I try to take any bad situation and turning into a learning opportunity. Yeah. So I, I really don't have any terrible cli- – I've nev- never had the terrible client. You know, I've always learned something from it. Um, probably the, the, the ones that have consistently not been good are when dealing with marketing managers and large corporations who are really overworked and that – and they have a bit of a per type A personality, so they're they're not kind of on the same wavelength as a creative. So yeah. they don't get the creative process, and so they are only interested in dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Yeah. 
And so, oh gosh, I mean, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I do about. know you because I've been I've been the marketing person that didn't understand the creative process. Mm-hmm. So I actually, when you're saying that, I can actually picture myself not understanding that there is a process. I just want to see finished product, right. or I don't understand. Like, what do you mean it took? It takes six hours of tape to make forty seconds of, of right of and and so I am the creative here but i'm also you know i'm very methodical about a lot of things i'm not the most creative person in the room and i'm you know i don't aspire to be to be, to be honest i i just really want to put the whole thing together so where i really get juiced is putting an awesome team together like what i have nice. right now yeah, yeah. and is it, it's truly is a collaborative effort but with somebody leading but also having their eyes and ears open to listen to other input you know so i'm not a dictator a benevolent dictator on any sense of the word of how projects go i'll go down the line and we approach it because you really have to it it unless it is a you know a a passion piece for your own self even a passion piece needs input from other people yeah uh, you know, you have such a wide variety of clients, and I know you keep them kind of close to the chest, so I won't start naming them out. But I am fascinated by that sometimes you are, well, you're, you, you're, you have clients in the brewing industry, you have ca- clients in the um, apparel industry, Is there, um, and then you have cl- clients in the cannabis industry. Is there places or places? You know, you're traveling all over the world right now. So are there sweet spots for you? I know that you mentioned that you like apparel. I mean, is there a certain spot that you kind of, and sustainability was really important to you. So where do you kind of see that trend for you? For years, it it has really been to to support my family and to support the company. You kind of have to take what what comes in. There's a minimum engagement that we use to kind of weed out the tire kickers, as it were. Um, And... Proximity to various clients had been something that was driving what we did, meaning that here in Everett, we had used to do a lot of work with Fluke Corporation. And in fact, I've done, they, they were actually some of my very first big clients yeah. as Fluke. And we did years of work for them. And not to really badmouth them, but they have changed so much that, and it's always looking for the bottom line. So the... The advent of bringing an in-house video guy or marketing guy in and then that person going away and externally hiring, there's a wave that just goes and we, we, I've ridden that ebb and flow all, you know, for many different times. And so like recently they had someone who left who was doing all their in-house stuff. I believe he just got burnt out. And oh then, man. But they, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't step up to want to hire somebody to even pay the minimum amount that is, you know, kind of fair. Yeah, and you so know, that they, seems they counterintuitive, yeah. especially with the advent of uh, so many big corporations bringing in full house, in-house studios, right? I right. mean, so uh, I'm kind of yep. surprised that that's the direction. That's a little scary for us, but it yeah. comes and goes. And, you know, then they start laying off all the people and whatever. Um, the thing that really... I've had to adjust what we do is the economy of scale of video that is this stuff that is kind of non-evergreen or throwaway. Right. So we're really trying to push companies to create video products that have a longer shelf life than, let's say, three to six months. Yeah. And if you are going to create that 36-month type of video, you got to create a crap load of it. Yeah. You know, so the ubiquity of video has created this enormous appetite for moving the needle with video. Right. But you got to do it. But on the other hand, a really quality, longer piece of video can totally move the the needle. Something that is engaging, sort of like the stories we were taking, uh, talking about yeah. on the authentic customer or why they're doing it. You know. So. It's I hope Matt's not in our shot. <laughs> <laughs> he could be. <laughs> he could be. Um, I, I, um, so anyway, that's kind of. Yeah, you know, this ho- whole idea. Go and ahead, I've and been a. Um, start your question again. Yeah. Uh, this idea that, and I've been a, um, 
an abuser of this is, uh, you know, I feel like I can use my phone and I can take the video myself. You and absolutely can do that. And there is a place for that. That was kind of the thing I was getting out. That there, I've embraced that for the longest time. I was like the grunt, grumpy old camera guy that didn't, you know. Mm. But everybody has a movie maker in their pocket, yeah. and you should do that. But and that is a type of video. It is totally fine, and it's amazing, beautiful thing about the world that you know how many beautiful things are put and you go ahead and do it. You should go ahead and do those things. Yeah. You know, I think my thing is, is that, um, there has been, I think I'm coming to the point though, where I, it's because everybody is just taking pictures and video with their phone that now in order to differentiate yourself, you really do have to step up your game. And I'm seeing that all the time. Like people, uh, our my audience isn't really that interested in uh, my selfie cam. They're looking for a more highly curated storytelling. I'm having to compete with other um, folks that are doing the same kind of thing. And if I'm going to help promote these makers in Snohomish County, I have to, I have to step up my game. And so I wouldn't. Um, I can do uh, my books to a certain level and then i have to bring my accountant in there's certain thing you know there's mm. a, like you know yep. for a small day to day yeah i am fully capable yep. and i have the skill set to do it but when i look at okay for for companies and corporations and and you know uh other uh marketing agencies yeah you can you can maintain certain level in-house but if you do want to differentiate yourself like other people and com with your from your competitors, you are really going to have right. to step it up. And when you're on, let's say, you know, YouTube and or and Instagram, y you can really tell the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. Chaff is yeah. that the word? Wheat from the chaff? Chaff? Whatever. But you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. The wheat germ from the kernels. I was going to say I was gluten free, but I'm not. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not. Um, <laughs> but you know. The utilitarian aspect of you using, let's say, how-to videos on YouTube, there's totally a place for doing it. I can't tell you how many times doing something around the house, working on my motorcycle, I needed to figure out something, why this thing. I went and found a guy sitting a little crappy video camera, setting it, uh, yeah, here it is, right yeah. there, and see that little thing right there? You take this out, and there's that little gym pin. <laughs> Fantastic. Exactly. It's amazing. Yes. You know, that is video. Yep. And, you know, but then you see the, the highly curated posts on Instagram for these adventure people. And you go, holy cow, how did they get that shot? Where, yeah. you know, where is, why is this woman all over the world? Yeah. And who was her cameraman? Yes. And, yeah. you know, but the back end story is that they're probably influencers getting paid $20,000 yep. or $10,000 sure. an image. Yeah. And that uh, is fabulous, I thought, yep. you know. Yeah. No, I think um, there was a, a little bit of you know, fear of like, okay, can we keep up and can we maintain? But I think that um, people are s also stepping up their individual game. Mm -hmm. I think that they're, th I think that the world is raising their expectations right. of what they're willing to right. put in front of their eyes, as well as, you know, a podcast for the ears, you know, if it's not going right. to, you know, before you, what do they say before I ask somebody to put the headphones on their ears, like, please just make it a good sound quality. And so yeah. at some point you're going to have to like take it out of your bathtub. Right. And like actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's that's the thing about. About the. Stepping up your game is then it comes back around, you know, everyone in my industry, you know, I was just terrified of people getting, you know, uh, the iPhone shoots HD. Oh, my gosh, my business is going to go away. But you, you know, to be honest, I would bring the same amount of lighting, the same amount of grip equipment. If I shot it with an iPhone yes. or my F fifty five with the Angelou lens is forty five thousand yeah, dollars. Right? Yeah. I yeah. would use the same amount of extraneous. I would have a boom, I would have all that same stuff. Right. Just the camera would be different. And I would have a yeah. crew too. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Well that's why you're a professional. No, yeah. I think that um it's it's also I, I think that I've had to recognize where my skill set lies mm -hmm. and where what lane I wanna be in. And Matt said to me a couple times, like, oh, I want, I wanted a drone. And 
I was working with somebody who knew how to fly a drone. I absolutely love drone shots. I just, uh, you know, I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And so I was like hell bent and determined that I'm buying a drone. And he kept saying, you don't need a drone. You need to hire somebody who knows how to fly a drone mm-hmm. and just hire it out. And I'm like, no, almost anything in my, my life, I always teach myself mm-hmm. how to do. I do not mm-hmm. delegate. It's just one of those. Right not one of my best qualities and so i was hell-bent on getting one and finally i just did it and said oh by the way we're meeting some guy in the starbucks parking lot and i'm buying this drone and he's like oh my gosh well i flew that drone into a tree about a minute and a half after launching it thank you matt for getting it out of the tree i mean i'm thinking okay i watched three or four youtube videos trying to figure out how to fly a drone I uh, have never played video games i mean i had no business doing this and Mm. then do you think that I ever flew that thing again? Nope, but I did hire somebody to fly it for me. You know, it's like, right. okay, stay in your lane. I could have saved myself a lot of time, right. energy. It's, you know, my ego but wanted that drone. to be a little um, on the, I don't know, the, uh, the side of, of consoling you, the newer ones are so amazing that it wouldn't let you fly it into a tree, <sighs> you know, like the Mavic. And oh, the I was, Mavic. Oh. I was just with a guy that, that flew it, and we were out in Yakima, and he took it up 2,000 feet, which is, you know, the ceiling is like 400 feet. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, he took it seven feet above the water, drew a finger on the line of the screen with a GPS, and said, fly this track, and he didn't even touch it. Oh, my gosh. That's so amazing. And the thing is this small, right? Oh, my gosh. Uh. And it got 4K video, which was overcranked to 60 frames. It was beautiful. Oh, my gosh. That sounds – oh, see? Yeah. But so, hey, yeah, that's consoling. T- well, I, I appreciate that. The other thing I just want to tell every drone operator who's captured video, they send them to me to use. And it's they make these beautiful commercials about Snohomish County oh, that right. is just frame after frame after frame of aerial visu- aerial shots. No people, just right. treetops and tree treetops and bridges and waterfalls. And it's like, put some people in there, man. I mean, there's yeah. no storytelling. It's yeah. just a m- massive landscape. That's another thing that, that I, I notice a lot is you see young guys uh, getting all the gear, getting all the right stuff, and all it is is beauty shots of stuff that is yeah. out there, right? You know, where's the interaction? Where's the human element? Where's the story? Where's the story? There's no story. No story. No human. You know, that's the hard part is yeah. to to create that and that's kind of what we're working at at Ber- baker built works is is some of the story aspect in fact on the back of my card it says creative storytellers you know yeah. in fact and part of our logo is a book with a little arrow with a fast forward in there yeah. if you ever looked at that but i think that's why you'll never be out of business yeah. because there's always going to be somebody with a phone in their pocket or a drone in mm-hmm. the sky but if they don't have the ability to tell a great story like you can capture right. um the narrative then you know and i think that's where you really excel i hope so yeah well thanks for having me loved having you (laughs) 